Today we're going to be learning Masechet Rosh Hashanah Dafav. Today's Daf is sponsored by Penny Gershom in memory of Shandel Statman Stein. Shandel started learning Daf Yomi the cycle and unfortunately passed away this week. Um, they are learning the in memory. Um, okay, we're going to start now a little bit of review of what we did. We took this verse, we were talking about Baal Ta'akhir, someone who doesn't fulfill their vows on time. So we saw that there was this Braita, the Darshan, the Pasuk, to say it's not just a Nedar as appeared in the verse, in Dvarim, Parakaf Gimel, Pasuk Bet. It's not just Nedarim, vows, it's Nedavot, which we'll talk today about the differences between Nedar and Nedava. It's all sorts of Korbanot. It's Staka, which we'll also talk about today. There's a bit of a difference with regard to Staka and all the others. And we had Lekhet Shechan Pe'ah and all sorts of other things. And then we basically took this Braita, right? And then we went into detail, into all these details. And the end of the Braita, the Darshan from the verse, said when it says, Vayabachachet, it means you have a sin upon you if you do this. But the actual animal that you designated and didn't bring on time is actually not disqualified. You can still bring it as a korban. To which we said, well, why would we learn it from there? We learn it from Bechor, also there. The Bechor, even though it passed its first year, the Bechor has to be brought within its first year, even though it passed its first year, it's just, it's not disqualified. You've done something wrong, but by not sacrificing it, but it's not actually disqualified. And then we said, maybe you would distinguish between Bechor, which doesn't come for appeasement purposes, for atonement purposes, versus all other sacrifices, which do, and maybe you'd differentiate. However, the Gemara still asks, we still don't need our verse to teach you that because it can be learned from somewhere else as well. So that's where we're going to start today, the very last word of Ham Ubet. Va'akate, but still, midi ben azai, nafka. You could also learn it from this drasha ben azai, which is Ditanya. Ben azai omer, and this one is not going to relate to some other topic, but it's going to relate directly to nidarim and balta achir. And then it's going to be clear, and then we're going to basically reject the b'rita. The, what the Brighta said, and say we have to change the Brighta because it doesn't make any sense. So let's look at this drasha. Ben Azai says, Oto. Okay, now we're quoting a Pasuk, totally different context. I brought it on the sheet, so if you have the sheet, you can look, or if you have the Pesukim on the side of your Gemara, it says here, in Vayikor Perek Zayin, Pasuk Yudchet, Im ha'chol ye'achel mi b'sar zevach shlama v'yom ha'shlishi, which sounds like no tar, if you leave over the meeting, you eat it beyond the designated time. Lo ye'ratza ma'chiv oto, Lo yichashev lo, pigul yihyeh. This will be pigul. It's a very confusing pasuk because it starts talking about notal, which is when you leave over the meat beyond the time you're allowed to eat the meat, the sacrificial meat. And then it switches into pigul, which is talking about when the Kohen has the wrong intent, when he thinks while he's slaughtering, that he's going to sprinkle the blood in the wrong place or the wrong time, something like that. Again, we'll get into this more in detail when we learn this head on. And this Pasuk is quoted many, many times in Shas, trying to figure out what he mean. It was talking about Notar, but then it was talking about Pigal. It's a very confusing Pasuk. But the main part for us is that you can't eat the Pigal meat, and if you have a Pigal Korban, it's actually disqualified. Okay, like let's say he slaughters it to sprinkle the blood in the wrong time. He doesn't, right, the re- it's, it's disqualified at this point. He can't bring the blood on the altar. So it says here, Hamakriv Oto Lo Yichashevlo, and it says Lo said This will not be accepted. Oto It. Okay. Now, what do we darshan from the word It? It seems to say this and not something else. That's what the drasha is going to talk about. So it says, let's go back to Benaza. Oto Matamulamar. Why did it say It is no good? It just could have said Pigul Yihye. You know, it didn't need to say It, and it's also said Lo Yiratzet. It won't be accepted. You don't need the It. So Now they quote our verse. Because it says, don't delay in fulfilling your vows. You might have thought that if you passed the designated time and you had set aside this animal and you didn't bring it as a sacrifice, that animal can no longer be brought on the altar. So that you don't think that, it says, It comes to say, just here, not anywhere else. So at this point, we no longer need this trasha. It seems totally unnecessary. We have a different drasha. So the Gemara says, let's change the text. You might be surprised by this halacha. There's two interesting things about women. We'll start this year with women. We'll end with women. Um, so now it says, You might have thought, Not clear which one of them said this. Not clear which one of them said this. 
the only time a woman of a man will die for his sins, okay, it doesn't say that, but that's what they mean, for something he does wrong, is in a case, okay, we're going to have to discuss this, this sounds very difficult, it's in a case where they ask him for money and he doesn't give, what it means is he stole money and he doesn't return it. In that case, she also dies for his sins, okay? Now, we'll talk about that in a minute, why that is, but let's just see where they get it from, Shanaimal, as it says now, you would expect it to be a Pasuk from the Torah, but no, in fact, it's a Pasuk from Mishle, Proverbs, It's very interesting how we learn halacha from Mishle, but, or it's not exactly halacha, it's not like anyone's killing the woman, it's just saying that a woman is responsible, okay, we're going to see, talk about it in a minute why that might be, you can already start thinking your own reasons, because it doesn't actually say the reasons, but the Pesach of Mishle says, right, if you stole something and you don't, you don't pay it back, or you don't have the money to pay it back, right, why are they going to take your bed out from under you? Okay, which sounds like, right, you're going to lose your house, you're going to, you know, you'll be punished. But they darshan mishkavcha as your wife. You're going to lose your wife. Your wife is going to die for your sin. Okay, which is a very strange thing to say. But let's just talk about it for one minute, what they're saying in the Gemara, and then we'll try to zoom out and try to understand this. So what they're saying is, the only time a woman will die for her husband's sins is if he doesn't return a stolen item. However, if he doesn't pay his his vows on time, then she's not responsible. She's not going to die for that. Okay? That's what it teaches you. Okay. Why would a woman die for the sins of her husband if he steals something, right? So the only thing I could come up with is that there's this assumption, right? It's uh, in general, let's say your spouse does something that's inappropriate in the community. Right? So it reflects on you, right? There's, and why does it reflect on you? Some say it's unfair, but it's not really unfair because you're, you have a partnership and what one does affects the other. And it's also because if he's not, now think about it, he stole. She's not responsible if he stole. But if he doesn't return it, it's in their house. She knows it's in the house. She should convince him to return it. In other words, this is something that she's a party to. She might even be benefiting from it, right? So there's effects on the wife. The wife is responsible as well in this area. We're right? saying when it comes to you and God, that's you and God and your commitment to God is your commitment. That's not your wife's commitment, okay? You might think, Right. What, what was the Hava meaning? You might think it's similar because both are paying something that you owe, but it's not the same as having a stolen item in your house and not returning it to not paying up your, your vow on time. Okay, I'm sure there's a lot more to be said for this and think about why, right? It sounds very harsh, especially in general. We say, Ish o yumat, right? People die for their own sins. So I think you can only really understand it in a way that she has to be somehow a party to this. Otherwise, it wouldn't be fair to make her responsible, especially it even says she dies, which is quite harsh. I mean, it could be a bit of an exaggeration. But um, but anyway, right, I see that Shoshana is quoting Achan and how the wife and children, right, were connected. And it also comes up, by the way, with um, Tatan and Aviram and their families, and also their families are involved in Korach's family. Children didn't die, and Tatan and Aviram, their families did. There's a whole thing there. It's Again, that's children, not spouses, but also I think spouses were involved. Anyway, it's uh, right. also one of them, the wife convinced him not to go, right? The, the Om Ben Pellet disappeared, and I think they say his wife convinced him. So you all throughout, you see this influence of wives, whether positive or negative, or, you know, the Zizevel. I mean, she clearly influenced Ahav in a very poor way. So anyway, I think there's some a lot more to be said there. Moving on, though. Tanu Rabbanan. Now we're going to quote a Brighton that's very parallel to the one we saw yesterday again. The Brighton we saw yesterday took this verse about Lo Ta'acher Shalmo. Right? And it darshaned all the parts to say it's not just a neder, it's also all sorts of other things. And we had a few extra things from there. If you look to Psukim later in the Torah, in Perak Bet, Perak uh, Kav Gimel in Tvarim, Pasuk Kav Dalid, okay, so it skips one Pasuk, it also talks about neder and that Pasuk in between. And then there's another verse, and that's the one we're going to darshan right now. So I put, brought it on the sheet as well. If you have the sheet in front of you, Motsas Vatecha Tishmor, watch what comes out of your mouth. Vasita Kasher Nadar Tal Hashem Lokecha, and do like you promised to God. This sounds like an almost repeat of the previous one. Nidava asher dibarta bapicha. And not only in there also in Nidava. Here Nidava appears in the verse. So now we're going to darsh in this pasuk. Motzas fatecha zo mitzvata se. Okay, so motzas fatecha comes to teach you there's a positive commandment here. Not just a negative, but a positive commandment to fulfill bringing your vows to the temple. Tishmol, but the word lishmol is usually used to, to, to connote a lotase, 
Okay, there's actually a debate about it, but there's right, there's people who say pen al hishamel. Okay, Rashi says this. Um Rabbi Avin Amar Rabbi Eli, Koma Kom Shnemar, Hishamer, Pen. Al is a lotase. So Tishmor, where do we see it? Also, Zachor and Shamor. Zachor are the positive things about Shabbat, and Shamor are the low tasset. Right? Don't do this, don't do that. So now they say, right, there's the famous drasha about women, if we're already on the topic of women. Kosha yeshno bishmira, yeshno bishchira. Women are obligated in Kiddush on a Torah level, because whoever is obligated in the negatives is also obligated in the positives. So even though maybe it might be time bound, they happen to be obligated here. So now they say, okay, so we have a mitzvah tasse. But we also, and also, Tishmor comes to say a lotase. So this passage says an ase and a lotase. Ba'asita, what does that word come to teach you? Now, I don't know if you've ever heard the term get me'use. Okay, if you haven't heard the term, you've definitely heard of this situation, what it means. A get me'use is a get that, it comes from the, the root ase in Hebrew, ayin sin he. It's a get that they force the husband to give a get. Okay, now how do you force a husband to give a get? The get has to be given with the husband's ratzon, with he has to go willingly. So what we do is, right, we, we take away his driver's license, we put him in jail, we do all sorts of things in order to convince the husband to give the get to the wife. That's a case, it's called mi'use. It's a get that we basically force the husband, but we force him to do it agreeably. Okay, that's, that's how we resolve, you know, we try to resolve anyway, aguna cases. So, right, one of the ways to resolve them. So, now they're going to say the same thing here. Vasita, Asara lebeitin she yaasucha. That's what yaasucha means. Vasita means really they're darshning it, not vasita. You should do, which is talking about the person himself. It's talking about the the um, the court can come in and force the husband to fulfill the vow. Or the not the husband. Sorry, that was the get case. Force a person, a man or woman, committed to bring something to the temple to bring their vow. So now that we'll get to later or women part of this whole obligation in general, but let's assume yes right now. So, Lashem lo kecha elu, so, ah, uh, sorry, kasher, ah, uh, that's it, yasucha. Kasher nadavta ze neder. Okay, so that, obviously, this refers to nidalim. Now we're going into what else does this refer to? Lashem lo kecha. Now we're going to darshan it differently than we darshaned it in the previous pasuk. Lashem lo kecha, there was the cherem and the damim and the erchin and all that, the bedek habayit. Here, Lashem lo kecha. Is chataot ashamot olotu shlamim. Nidava kimashmao. Okay, that's obvious. That's what it is. Asher dibarta ele koche bede kabaye. Because usually bede kabaye, you say, I'm giving the value of this. I'm giving the value of that. That's with your mouth. So asher dibarta teaches you that. And beficha zot staka. With your mouth, that's staka. Okay, asher dibarta is those. Beficha includes staka. So now we're going to go in detail and try to understand these different sections. Some of them ask questions, some of them explain. Why do you need to say it's a mitzvah ase? We already have that this is a mitzvah ase from a different place. Remember, that was what Rabbi Meir said. That's how we know it's one regel, because it says when you get there, you have to bring it. Others said, no, 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 that's just a mitzvah ase. That doesn't mean Baal Tachir kicks in at that point, but it's a mitzvah ase. So we already have a mitzvah ase. You have to fulfill your vow. So why do we need the uh, this one? Tish, so now they say, Tishmor. Okay, that's question number one. They don't really answer this question. Tishmor is no mitzvah lotase. Lamali. Why do you need another mitzvah lotase? We already had a mitzvah lotase from lotacher l'shamo. Okay? Mi lotacher l'shamo nafka. We already have a lotase. What, two lotases in the same mitzvah? It doesn't make any sense. Vasita, and third question, which is the one we're going to answer, yakriv oto, melamed shekofin oto. Ah, sorry, did I just, I skipped the line. Vasita as harala betin shiasucha. Also that, Lamali, Miya Afka. We can learn that also from another Pasuk. What other Pasuk? So each of them, we're basically saying we can learn this elsewhere. So where do we learn it from? Ditanya Yakrivoto. This is a Pasuk in the beginning of Sefer Vayikra. And it says, if you want to bring a Korban Ola from the Bakar, from the cattle, Zacharta Mi it has to be males. Uh, Olas are always male. El Petach Ol Moed Yakrivoto. You'll bring it to the opening of Ol Moed. You'll sacrifice it. Lirit Sono, according to his will. Lifne Hashem, before God. So now, we're going to darshan that pasuk. Yakriv oto, and we're going to see that from here we get this idea that the baiting can force someone to fulfill a vow, in which case, we don't need our, our drasha. So let's see. Yakriv oto, malamech kofin oto. Yakriv oto means you have to give it no matter what. So that means the baiting can come and force you. Once you commit, 
you have to commit and the Beitin can come in. Yechol bal korcho, maybe it means they can force you to do it even if you don't want to anymore. So, Tamu Lomar Liritzon, no, it says according to his, what he wants. So it has to be Biratzon. Like, let's say I decide I want to bring a Korban and then I change my mind. At that point, the Beitin can try to force me, but I say I don't want to do it. I, I, you know, it's not, Korban has to be brought with my will. So, Haketzad, so how does that work? That they can force you, but it has to be your will. And this, we already know where they're going. Kofino Tawachim Arotzani, right? They twist his arm until he says, okay, I want to do it. Okay, so that's what we learn from that verse. So, in which case, we don't need to learn it from our verse, because that's what we tried to learn from our Pasuk. So, what do they answer? Chad Amar Velo Afrish, Chad Afrish Velo Akriv. Okay, this really actually answers all the questions now that I realize it really answers all three questions because it's saying, all of them were saying this, this seems unnecessary. So now they're saying no. They're both necessary. Why are they both necessary? Because they're each relating to different kinds of situations of a vow. What could the two situations be? One is Amar Velo Afrish. There's three stages. The first stage is I say, I vow to bring something to the temple. Then I find an animal, I designate it, and I sanctify it. Then already, it belongs to God because it's sanctified. It's not mine anymore. The third stage is I bring it to the temple and I sacrifice it. So now the question is, we're going to say, one is he did stage one and not two. One is he did stage two and not stage three. And we're going to talk about why you would need a pusset for each one. Okay, and that's why we have this re- this repetition of drashot. So that's chad amar v'lo aflish. He said, I'm going to do it, but didn't actually separate it. Chad aflish v'lo akliv. And one is, she separated it, but didn't sacrifice it. Utsricha, you need them both. Why? Di'iyash mu'ina namar v'lo aflish. If you say, it's where the person specified, said, I'm going to do it, but didn't actually designate an animal yet. Mishum de lo kaime l'dibure. You'd say, look, that's lo ta'cher. You said you were going to do something. You didn't do it. However, but if you designate it and didn't sacrifice it, Ema, we could say, listen, and this is why I specifically said it in that way before, wherever this animal is, it belongs to God at this point. I've already given something to God. It's true. I haven't sacrificed it, but I'm not benefiting from it anymore. I can't use it anymore. It's got God's name on it. It's as if it's in God's treasure home. Okay. So therefore, I've already done something by designating it. Maybe that's enough. Okay, it's obviously not fully enough, but you might have thought that's why you need the second verse to teach you. Also, in that case, you're going to be liable for delaying. Therefore, it's tzricha. Now we're going to do the flip, which is what if we only had that case? If you had this case where you did stage two and not three, because you basically already designated this animal and now you're holding it and you're not bringing it. Right? That's, what, that's the best case of delaying according to this logic. Again, we're taking logic and flipping it. We're saying, that's the most obvious. You've already designated the animal and you're not bringing it. That's a problem. But, but if you just said you're going to bring this to the temple and you don't even designate an animal, it's all just, right? you didn't do any action yet. So what we normally say is an action, well, not we're going to talk about it, not really, but that actions are stronger than words. Right? So if you designate the animal already, that's when really your obligation kicks in to bring it as a sacrifice. If I just said I'm going to do something, how seriously do we take our words? Okay, so kamashwan, right? Sricha, therefore you need it to tell you no. Your words are super significant. We're going to have a whole mesecha just on neder and your words and what you said and what you commit to do and how it's very important. And just by saying that's enough to make a commitment for yourself. Okay, I mean, all over the Gemara, there's... You know, we have a lav she'en bomase, which is less difficult if you do a lotase by just words. It's not the same as actually with an action. So there's always this debate, how seriously are words, how much we take them, etc. So this seems to say when it comes to these kind of things, you make a vow, that's considered as if you've done an action. But you might not have thought that. That's why you need a verse to teach you. So what we basically say is we have one set of verses to teach you, right? Whether it's the ase, the lotase, or the, the fact that the baiting can force you is Amar Velo Ifrish. We have another set to teach you, right, which is, let's say, our Pasuk Motzas Vatecha Tishmor, which will make sense. It's teaching you, watch what you say with your mouth, right? It's all in your mouth, your words. That's Amar Velo Ifrish, right? Just by saying it, even if you haven't yet designated the animal, you're already going to be liable for the Ase, the Lot Ase, and the Beitin can force you. So now the Gemara is going to have a question on this. Umi Matzit Amar to Amar Velo Ifrish. You want to say that that verse is referring to a case where the person said and didn't 
do anything yet. Veha nidava ktiva. It says in that verse, nidava. Okay, now what's a nidava? I just mentioned this yesterday. There's a difference between neder and nidava. Now we're going to get inside and see exactly what the differences are between them. Utnan. And it says in the Mishnah, a Mishnah, ezehu neder. What's the difference between neder and nidava? So here it goes. Neder is haomer hare alai ola. I'm accepting it upon myself to bring a burnt offering to the temple. Ve'ezohi nidava. Ha'omer hare zo ola. You see an animal and you say, that animal is going to be my korban ola. What's the difference? Uma be neder the nidava, exactly what the Mishnah asks. Neder mate onignav chaya b'acharayuto. I took it upon myself to bring a korban ola. When I then go and I take an animal, if something happens to that, uh, designated for this korban, and something happens to that animal, it dies, gets stolen, what happens? Do I have to bring a korban? Of course I do, because I have to bring a new animal, because I said, hare alai. That's a neder. So again, the main thing is, neder, you're obligated, you have responsibility. But nidava, if you word it in that way, meta unignavai, no chayab If I say this animal is for a korban, then I'm basically designating that animal. I'm not designating myself as responsible. I'm saying this animal will be a nidava. Of course, I'm responsible to bring it. But if something happens to the animal, since I said this animal is going to be a korban, if something happened to the animal and it died or was stolen and I can't bring the animal, I'm no longer obligated in this, what I committed to. So that's a case of you're not responsible. So now, why does this have anything to do with anything? Because we were trying to say that the pasuk that says nidava in it is where I said I'm going to bring a korban, but I didn't yet designate the animal. Now, a nidava by nature of nidava is harezo ola. That means I designated the animal. There is no stage of speaking without designating. So how could I possibly say that the verse is referring to a case where I spoke and didn't designate when there is no such thing by nidava? There's no nidava without designating the animal because I already, from the beginning, I say this is, this animal is nidava, is to the, you know, for the Beit HaMikdash. So it doesn't make sense. So Gemara says no, because if you really hone in, Rava says, if you really hone in on neder and nidava, it's true, it's really the language, but it's really responsibility. That's the difference. If something happens to the animal I choose, do I have to replace it or not? That's the main difference. So therefore, if you want to find a case, where you could have an adava, where you just said and you didn't designate an animal, and yet it would still be categorized as an adava. What would that be? So Rava says, Amarava mishkach alai, you could find the case, kigon de amar hare alai ola, al minat she'eni chaya ba'achayuta. You say, I'm, you say the language of an ender. I'm accepting upon myself to bring a korban ola, but under the condition that if something were to happen to the animal, I'm not responsible. In other words, I'm only going to bring the first animal I find, but you haven't yet designated an animal. That's how you can find a case, and that's how we resolve it. Okay, so basically we did so far, once we got past the first part of, of you know, trying to figure out what this rasha is, bechachet v'lo bekorbancha, and then we, we basically rejected that and said, no, it's becha v'lo b'ishtecha. Then we brought this bride to motas v'techa. We said, this seems to be redundant. We then said, no, it's not really redundant because they're each talking about different cases. Amar v'lo ifrish, ifrish v'lo ikri. Now we're going to go to other parts of this bride. V'fich hazot staka. So now we're going to learn we would have thought until now that stuck is the same thing. How much time do you have to do? Well, it depends on which of the five opinions you hold by. One regal, two regals, three regals, three regals in order, only chag sukot. Either which way, one of those. But Amarava, Utztak, Rava's the guy today. He's, he really says a lot of statements on our daf. Utztakam alte. You're immediately chayv and stuck. Okay, it's not clear what immediate means, right? It sounds a little scary. You say you're going to get stuck, you have to do it immediately. Hold off. Don't get nervous. My taima. Takaime anie. Anim, because there's a poor person in front of you who needs the money, you say, I'm going to give him, you have to give him right away, or her. They need it. They need the money. They're standing in front of you. So now, obviously, take this to where you want to take it. If you're giving money to a nonprofit that doesn't feed poor people, then this wouldn't be relevant. If you're giving it to, a, to a, an organization that has money in the bank right now and is feeding the poor people, right? And you make a commitment. So again, there's ways to get around this. But if someone's standing in front of you and you say, I'll give them stuck, and then you don't, then you really are in trouble, right? Then you really need to. So, and again, what la altar means to mean that minute, that hour, that day, right? It's not so clear, but it does mean pretty much right away. So the Gemara says, Pshita, obviously, if there's people waiting for you for money, you have to give them right away. So they say exactly what I said before, which is, since we learned it from the Pasuk about Korbanot, 
and ad korbanot ad avrei alei shal shal regalim ki korbanot. You might have thought it's the same. Kamash malan hatamu ditzlinu rachmana beregalim. There it depended in a regalim. Aval hachalo da hashlichei anim. Here we have a lot of situations where there's poor people and they're, they're, they're there. Therefore, you have to you have to give it right away. It's not the same as there. There's really two differences. One is there's poor people here, and number two, those are all connected to the regalim because when would you pay your vows when you go on aliyah la regal to the temple? Staka is not connected at all to the regalim. You see the poor people in your community all the time. You don't go on aliyah la regal to see poor people. So maybe you'll see poor people there too, but it's not connected at all to the regalim. So therefore, it's it's not. Amarava, as I said, Rav is going to have a lot to say here. Not only is there a mitzvah ase, to fulfill it on time, but once you even pass one regal, even though one regal normally we say you're not liable unless you're Rabbi Meir. But if you remember when we said, what did, what did the others do with the Pasuk of Rabbi Meir? We said they learned from here, it's a mitzvah ase. You're supposed to bring it the first regal you get to. It's true, you're not liable until three pass or depending on what opinion. But Soon as one passes, you already didn't fulfill your mitzvah ase to do it on time. So now they say, Metive, wait, seems to be a contradiction. It says in the following bright, Tehid, Rabbi Yeshua, and Rabbi Papias, Al Vlad Shlamim, Shikav Shlamim. Okay, we're going to learn a bunch of other halachot today. If you have a, an animal you designated for Korban Shlamim, and the animal became pregnant or was pregnant when you designated it, the Vlad, the baby that's born, if the baby's born before you sacrifice it, also has to be brought as a Korban Shlamim. So, they both testified to this halacha. Then, Amarav Papias. Ani Me'id, not only is he testifying about the halacha, he's testifying now about a case that happened, that he did it. Shaita lanu para, shal zivchei shlamim, v'achanua bepesach. We brought it on Pesach, the mother. And then, achalnu vlada shlamim bechag. And then, we did the vlad, the baby, we brought the offspring on chag. What is chag? Chag is always a word for chag shavuot. I'm sorry, chag sukkot. Right, Bachad Nidonim Alamayim. It's a very famous, right? It's um, we're going to get to it here. I think I think it's in Russian. I forget now. But Bachad Nidonim Alamayim on Chag Sukkot. That's when we get judged on water. Chag is always Chag Sukkot. Okay. So Bishlama Pesach Lo Akovu. Here comes the question. We understand maybe they didn't sacrifice the Vlad on Pesach. Why? Maybe it was born just as Pesach was starting, and you need to have the 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 animal has to be eight days to do it. So Imur Demachusar Zman Ava. Maybe it just wasn't old enough. But But how did they skip Shavuot if there's a mitzvah ase, like Rava says? Then they should have done it on Shavuot. Why did they do it on Sukkot? So, two answers. Maybe the animal was sick, and you're not allowed to bring a sick animal as a sacrifice. They had to wait till it got better. It was sick on Shavuot. Maybe that's why. Rav Ashi Amal, now, I said very clearly, Chag always means Sukkot. He's going to say, what do you mean? Maybe Chag is Chag HaShavuot. Maybe when it said Chag here, it's true, normally Chag is Sukkot, but Chag is also, I mean, Shavuot is Chag. Maybe it just meant on the next Chag. So now they want to know, why didn't Rabbi Zera hold this? Okay, right, it was Rabbi, uh, sorry, Rabbi Zvid. Why didn't Rabbi Zvid hold this way? So they said, V'idach kol hechaditane Pesach tane atzeret. He says, ah, whenever it says Pesach and Shavuot connected, it always calls Shavuot Atzeret because it's like Shmini Atzeret, right? There's Sukkot and then the end of it is Shmini Atzeret. Likewise, Pesach, the end of it is Shavuot because we count the Shavuot from Pesach to Shavuot. So whenever it makes reference to Pesach, it calls it Atzeret. Therefore, if it says Chag here, it doesn't make sense. It would have said Chag and not Atzeret. And that's why he gives the other reason that he must have been sick. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Amar Rava, another halacha of Rava. Kevan shavu alav shlosha regalim bechol yom vayom over b'val ta'achem. I was thinking this like a prenup agreement. Make up, right, most of our, or many of the prenup agreements basically say that in the event of, right, the, there, there's a, there's a, you know, disagreement between the couple and one doesn't come to court, right? I'm not sure how they're worded anymore, but whether it's just in the, for the man or probably both, right? There's a, there's a penalty, a daily penalty to have to pay Every day you don't come to court. Okay, that's what they're saying here. Every day you don't bring your korban, this penalty, you've already done a mitzvah lotah, say, every single day. So now they're going to question him again. The structure keeps being the same. Rabbi brings halacha, they bring a question from a brayta. Echad bechor ve'echad kol ha-kodashim, kevan sh'avru alehem, shana b'lo rigalim, rigalim b'li shana, 
Over here, Achim. It's a very confusing Brita. We're not going to understand it yet. We'll understand it in a few minutes. Gemara is going to try to figure it out. But they basically say, whichever comes first, right? It's like saying, if a year passed without three regalim passing, or, which that doesn't make any sense, but we'll talk about that, or the three regalim passed without a year passing. That makes more sense because we said, right, you could be right before Pesach, and then you have Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot. When Sukkot comes, you're already liable, even though a year hasn't passed. So, if it happens that way or that way, you're over Babal Tachir. So that seems to raise a question on Rav, who said you're obligated every single day. So the Gemara says, Hi, my Tiyufte. We don't get the question. What's the question of this Braita? Doesn't This isn't talking about the same thing. So Amar Rav Kahani is now going to explain, Mandika Motiv Shapikar No, the person who asked the question, they were right for asking this as a question. Why? Michti Tana, Alave Kamahadya. Basically, the town is listing, you'll be liable in this case, you'll be liable in that case. It's adding different lavim. Oh, if the regal come right, the regalim passed before the year, or the year passes before the regalim. So it should have also said, and you're liable every single day that you, that passes. It's not exactly convincing, and that's exactly what they're going to say, and that's the answer. So therefore, since it was basically listing lavim, let me b'chol yom v'yom over it would have been very natural to have added that here. To which the Gemara says, v'ida, Rabba, who doesn't think that way, would say, Tana belav kamahadir. Lava yitega lo kamahadir. It's giving different examples of when you're chayav in a lav. It's not telling you how many day, what days you'll be chayav in a lav, right? That it, it basically keeps going every single day. You have an additional lav. It's not counting how many lavim. When you do one thing wrong, you could have several lavim. No, it's saying you could be liable if you do this case, or you're liable in that case, but it doesn't mean that they're referring to how many days after, right, that you're going to be liable. It's not talking about the same thing. This isn't really a question. But now we have to understand this bright in general. Gufa. Let's go into the bright. Echad bechor. Echad kol kodashim. Right? Whether it's a bechor, whether it's any other sacrifice. Kevan shavua lehem shana below regalim, begalim beli shana, over bebal tachir. That was the quote. So bishlama regalim below shana mishkachala. Regalim without a year we get. That's what we said. You could have three regalim. That's in a course of basically six months. Six months and a few days. Okay. You could have that very easily. Ella. Shana below regalim, hechim mishkachala. But how could you have a year without holidays? So Ella, they say, uh, sorry, hanicha. It could be explained well. Lemandi ile kisidran mishkachala. Ah, you could have a shana without regalim because if regalim means you have to have them in the order, chaga matzot, chaga shavuot, chaga sukkot. So if you let's say after chaga matzot, after Pesach, you make a neder, and then a year passes. Right? You haven't gone through three regalim starting from Chag HaMatzot. That's Rabbi Shimon's opinion. So you haven't gone through a year of regalim for the halacha as a Baal Ta'achir. That's what they're talking about. So that would make sense. But, right, that only mis- it makes sense if you're holding Kisidran. But, Ela Laman Delele Kisidran. But the ones who hold, you don't, it's not like that in the order of Chag HaMatzot, Chag Shavuot, Chag Sukkot. And they just say, any three regalim, so Hechem Mishkachala. How could you possibly have a, a case? So, Bishlama Lerebi. Okay, now before we even get to this, we have to go and give some background. There's a, the Psukim at the end of Sefer Vayikra talk about selling land. Now, the assumption is someone who sells land in the Torah is someone who's desperate for money. So, if you sell land, it depends. There's all different rules about buying back your land. Okay, there's certain rights you have to buy back your land when you get the money. So, if that's the case, then what happens is it depends where you live, what your rules are, how much time you have. So, if you live in a walled city, you get a shana tmima. You get one complete year to basically be able to buy back your property. After that, if they don't want to sell it back to you, they don't have to. So you get one year. So now they say, there's a machloka. How do you count this year? Ah, if you're ready, you could say it's a leap year. Okay, Then you could have a whole year without all three regalim if the timing is right. right? If, let's say, you do it right after Chag Sukkot. And then you count a year, and you don't count it by the leap year, then you're going to have a whole year before you get to Chag Sukkot again, right? Before you complete three regalim. So that would only work according to Rebbe, though. Why Rebbe? Because we're going to see right now. Detanya shanat mima, when it comes to this year that you have to buy back your land, what does he explain? Rebbe Yomel, very interestingly, monet shlosh meot v'shishim v'chamisha yom keminyan yimot hachama. It goes by the solar calendar. So if it's 365 years, it's actually 383 days in a leap year. So therefore, in a leap year, 
you could end up having a whole year go by of 365 days without having three regalim. Again, you would have to have done your vow very soon after one of the holidays. But if you did, then it wouldn't be. That makes sense. So for Rebbe, we have an explanation. But Chachamim have a different approach, and they're just going to, we're going to be stuck. Chachamim omrim, Monei Yud Bet Chodesh Miyom Liyom. He says, no, no, no. It's 12 months on the lunar calendar. Ve'im nitabra shana, nitabra lo. If it's a leap year, you get 13 months. Okay? Basically, it goes by the calendar. So in that case, you can't possibly have a year without all three regalim, because you're going to, your year is going to be an entire year. So, now they're going to explain what I already did, which is, Mishkach Alala Rebbe, you can find a case for Rebbe, Da'akta Shabbatar Chagamatzah. Okay, they give the example of right after Chag Pesach. You did it? T'kimat Ashilei Adar Batcha Shana Malia. When you get to the end of Adar Sheni, assuming they added an extra month, right? That's what we were talking about. It's in the leap year. You've already done a year, but you're still in Adar. You're not yet in Nisan. And therefore, Regalim Lo Malia, you haven't gotten yet back to Pesach, so you haven't had three Regalim. Elele Rabbanan Hechi Mishkach Alaba. Rabbanan, how could you have a case? So they say, well, it depends on a different machloket. There's a whole machloket about the date of Chag HaShavuot. Chag HaShavuot, there's no date in the Torah. Okay, we're getting into all different other machlokot today, other issues. No date in the Torah. It's just exactly on the 50th day after we start counting the Omer. So if that's the case, then it depends whether, okay, we're getting back to Rosh Hashanah issues and Kiddush HaChodesh that we're going to get to, to sanctifying the new moon, they would sanctify the new moon either on the 30th day or the 31st day, right? Every month either has 29 or 30 days. Now, if normally the way we have it, it comes out on Vav Sivan every year because we have a calendar and it's always one month is Malay, one month is Chaser, okay? That's how we have it, so it ends up on Vav. But if you were to make both months Chaser, meaning they'd each be 29 days, then Shavuot would be on Hei Sivan. And if both months were 30-day months, they decide, right? If they determine, when they determine the month, they would determine, right, what it would be at the, at the time. Did they see the new moon or not before we had a set calendar? So then it would be the seventh of Sivan. So basically, they say, Kid Rav Shmaya, as Rav Shmaya says, is what does he say? Um, and that's how you could explain how a year could pass without the Regalim. Kiditane Rav Shmaya, Atzeret Pamim, Hamisha, Pamim, Shisha, Pamim, Shiva. It could sometimes be on Hei B'Sivan, it could sometimes be on Vav B'Sivan, it could sometimes be on Zayin B'Sivan. So let's say this year it was on Hei B'Sivan, and you made a promise on Vav B'Sivan, and then the next year, okay, so you're after Shavuot already, the next year they decide that Shavuot is going to be on Zayin B'Sivan. So a whole year passes, but you haven't yet gotten to Shavuot. So according to him, that's how you would explain that, right? A very unique situation, but that's how you could explain it. So, Haketzad, how could it be? I already explained this, but sometimes the fifth, sometimes the sixth, sometimes the seventh. Shnehem and Le'im, if both Nisan and Iyar, which are the two months between, right, when we're counting Sfirat HaOmer, are going to be Malay, right, full months, then Hamisha, then it'll come out on the fifth. Shnehem Chaserim, if they're both missing, right, 29 day months, then Shiva. Echa Malay, Bechal Chaser, Shisha. If one is Malay and one is Chaser, then it's six. Okay? Um, tough. I might have said the reverse before. I hope I didn't. But the point is, if I said it wrong, I don't know. But 30 days, 30 days, right? Then the, the, the Shavuot's going to be earlier. Okay? If they're 29, 29, then Shavuot's going to be a later date. Hope I said that right. Okay. So now, they just want to know before they finish, Mantana de Palagale de who disagrees with him. So they say, Acherim, he has Acherim, which is another name for Rabbi Meir. Titania Acherim, Oblim, Ein ben Atzeret la Atzeret, Ein ben Rosh Hashanah la Rosh Hashanah. From year to year, how many days are in between? It's always the same. Every calendar year comes out the exact same thing. Every month is determined from the beginning. Ela arba yamin bovat. That means every year, if you say that sometimes it'll be male, sometimes chaser, and you can play with that, then theoretically you could end up with a year where there's more days than 354. We normally say there's 354 days in a year. That's because we hold like this. According to Rav Shmaya, if you have the ability to make months male, you could actually have more days in the year. So R54 is based on the fact that basically every other month is going to be Malay or Chaser. So there's like a few that, that kind of switch off. And that's a whole other thing. I'm not going to get into all the details now. But basically, according to this opinion, it's always going to be four days. If it came out on Sunday this year, it'll be Thursday next year. Okay, we don't exactly do this either. That's why it doesn't always come out like this. But it's 354 days. So 350 is divisible by seven. Add another. There's a remainder of four. That's why it's always four. So this is... Calendar year will always be 354. By us, it's not always the case. That's why sometimes the 
Chagim come out exactly the same the upcoming year. And also leap years, they're going to say right now, if it's a leap year, because a leap year always has a 29-day month, so that adds one more day to the whole calculation, and then it comes out. Now. Okay, a few more questions, and then we'll finish our daf. Three more questions for today. By Rabbi Zerah. Rabbi Zerah asked the following question. Someone who inherits property from, right, let's say someone's father dies. The father had committed to bring something to the temple. To the children, if they don't bring it in the time the father had said, are they liable? So, do we say, Kiti dor nedar amar said, when you make a vow, halo nadar, and you didn't make the vow. Odoma, ubata shama vebetam shama. Or it says, you have to go there and bring. Bring whatever you're obligated to bring. And you are obligated because you inherited something that was supposed to be brought. So what do we say? Tashma, let's learn from here. He had a bright bride that said, Mi'imach prat li'oresh. Comes to exclude someone who inherits. It says in the Pasuk, remember, Hashem lo'kecha daroshi uh, dirshenu Hashem lo'kecha. He will com- demand it. Mi'imach from you. You specifically means the one who took the vow. So then they say, wait a minute. We already darshan that pasuk to teach you about lechet shechan peah, that you have to give it to the poor people, right? It relates also to poor people. You know, to give, meaning, if you took the lechet shechan peah, remember, then you have to give it to the ani within the shalosha regalim. Baal ta'acher applies there. So we already darshaned it for something else. So what do they say? Kari be'imach ve'kari be'me'imach. You could read two parts. It could have just said imach. It says, Me'imach teaches you, you can darshan it in two ways. That resolves that problem. Next question. By Rabbi Zerah. Rabbi Zerah asks, Isha, ma'u bebalta achir? Right. This is what I told you we get back to. Very interesting situation. A woman, or a very interesting question, is a woman liable in balta achir? Now, why is it so interesting? Because listen to what they say. Here are his two sides. Mi'amrinan, halo mechayve b'ri'iya. She's not obligated. Yerae kol zichorcha. The schalim are supposed to go to the temple on the shloshah regalim. Not the women. So if this is connected to the fact that you're supposed to go to the temple, and then when you go to the temple, you bring your obligations, they're not obligated to go to the temple. Oh, Dilma, or do we say, ha'ita b'simcha? Wait a minute. She's not chayav in ri'iyah, but she is chayav in simcha. What is simcha? Often, right now, that's part of the problem here with the sugya. But simcha is defined often by saying, you bring korbanot shalmei simcha. You remember that? We learned you bring peace offerings and you're supposed to eat meat and be happy in Jerusalem on the holiday. You don't necessarily have to go to the temple, but you do have to go to Jerusalem. Once you're in Jerusalem, you know, pay up. So since she's part of simcha, yes. Now this answers the question, by the way. This whole sugya addresses a question many people asked when we were talking about Aliyah the regal in general, and specifically on Pesach, what, the men go and the women don't go, and how could that be? Isn't the holiday everyone's supposed to be together? This seems to imply that the women would go, because they're part of Simcha. They might not go because they're obligated in Riyah, but they are Chayv in Simcha, in which case they'd be going on Aliyah the regal. So this seems, and we'll see some sources, very interesting. I wanted to bring a few extra sources here. So he, that's his question. He says, once you already said they're obligated in Simcha, then of course they have to go, and of course then they have to be liable for Baal Ta'achim. So first, the Gemara question says, Mi amar abaye hachi? What do you mean? How could Abaye have said that? Har ma abaye isha ba'alam simcha. He says the obligation of simcha is for the husband. And what's the husband supposed to do? He's supposed to buy the woman clothing. Okay, I told my husband last night, okay, next chag, you're going to buy, shopping for me and buying me clothes. <laughs> okay, not really, but <laughs> um, I'm a little scared what would happen. But anyway, I think he hates shopping more than me. So, um, but the idea is here that the husband's, it's an obligation of the husband on the wife and the husband's, it's not an obligation for the woman herself. So there's no Baal Tav here, so how could I possibly say that? So the answer by saying, oh, Lidvarav de Rabbi Zera Kamar. He was talking according to Rabbi Zera. He was saying, you said that you think women are chayv in Simcha. They have to do Shalmei Simcha. If you're already saying they're chayv, then they have to come, of course, and do it on time. I don't think that, but I was, I was talking about you and what you think. Okay, now. Let's just look at the Rambam for a quick minute. It's on your sheet. The Rambam says, in Pilchot Chagiga Perak Aleph, Shtei mitzvot elu shehen ha-riyah v'chagiga e'en ha-shim chayvot. They're not chayv in Riyah, they're not chayv in Chagiga. That all goes together. V'asimcha ha-murah b'regali, she'akriv shlamim, in addition though, there's these shalmei simcha, and, okay, I'm skipping a little bit. He says, nashim chayvot b'mitzvazo. He says very clearly women are chayv in this. The Ravid now says, okay, now what's the reason? Because they're chayv in Shalmei Simcha, so because of that, they have to go on Ali Ala Regal, basically, even though not for Ali Ala Regal, but for the Shalmei Simcha. Comes the Ravid, he says very, something very nice. He says, Amar Avraham, that's how his quotes start. 
Lo, these are comments on the Rambam. Lo be korban, ella, it's not korban she's obligated in. Ella be simcha she tismachim ba'ala she ta'aleim mo v'hu yisameach ota. The idea is that they be together on the holiday. He says exactly what people were asking when it came to this issue of, you know, how could it be that they're in, they're having this holiday without all their wives? Here they say, no, 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 that's part of the mitzvah, that they be together. The simcha is not so much these korbanot simcha, it's that they be together on the regal. This, by the way, is good proof that, you know, spouses shouldn't be separate from each other on the regal, not having anything to do, right, exactly, Stacey, what I was thinking of Uman, right? Not, not to go off somewhere else and be separate from each other on the holiday, because there's this this is not connected to the to the temple at all. This is right not about shalnei simcha. It's a it's a very nice idea. Anyway, wanted to quote that. One last section. Ibai lehu b'chor ematay monim lo shana. Okay, now we're we're done with our topic. We're back to something we mentioned at the end of yesterday's talk about the b'chor. And we said the b'chor has to be brought within its first year. So when do you count the year? This is like a classic Amar question. When does the clock start ticking? Abai amar mishashen olad as soon as it's born. You can't bring it as a sacrifice until day eight. So it gets a year from day eight. Because as we said before, no one can be brought as a sacrifice until day eight. Then they say, they're actually not disagreeing. One's talking about a, a tam, a perfectly good animal which can be sacrificed. So that starts from day eight. A balmum starts from, if it, it was born, blemished, then we start counting from when it's born. To which the Gemara asks, balmum, my matze achile. But you can't eat it within the first eight days because you have to first make sure it's not a nefel, that it's not going to die before you can actually slaughter it and eat it. So if that's the case, this is because it's a bechor. You're not allowed to do that. You have to check and make sure. So now they say, well, and then why would the clock start ticking then? So they say, well, it's talking about the kimle b'kalu lo chadashaf. A nefel is only a concern if it wasn't a full-term pregnancy. But if you know that it was a full-term pregnancy, then you know it's not going to be a nephil, and then you could actually eat it from the beginning, and then you'd actually count from the very beginning. Okay, that's a very side issue, not as interesting as some of the other things we learned today. Anyway, we'll end with that today. Have Shabbat Shalom, everyone.